In this video, we're going to be walking through optimizing your database searches because your workload may skyrocket if you overcomplicate this part of your app's logic. So follow these best practices so that you can keep your searches as efficient as possible. It'll help you keep your costs down and your app performing much better for your users. All right, so I'm going to take you through a demonstration of a search feature here. It's a really popular type of approach to searching through a list of things in your database. Um, we've got a little bit of everything in terms of the type of expressions that are available to you. So I want to point out where there are opportunities to optimize, just some things to look out for so you can keep your workload consumption down and things performing nice and fast for your users. So in my example, I have a table here. Uh, you can do this with repeating groups as well. I've got six users. Every user is going to have a few different properties that will vary in their values between them. So I have hobbies, for example. Each user can have one or more or none uh, in this list. Uh, they also have an onboarding status. They may have been onboarded or not. And then I've got some inputs here for the user to interact with so that they can filter down this list. So for example, right now I'm viewing everybody regardless of their onboarding status. I can switch over to onboarded only. See, it filters them down to those three. Then the opposite, not onboarded. I can go back to view all. With my hobby input here, this is a multi-select function. So if I want to choose running, filters it down to three, and also painting now down to two. I'm being more specific, right? My users have to have both of my selections in here. I'm going to clear this again. And then I can also search by name. So if I wanted to search by Geller, um, I'm seeing my two users that have Geller in the name. These are also working together. So if I have a name search and then I also want to choose running, it's only going to show me the users that have both of those things. Uh, applying. Okay, so there are actually a, a number of combinations that can happen here for this filter. And of course, I've got a clear button there. So let's jump into the editor so I can point out a few things on how this works and just some, some items to keep in mind. So my table has a data source, which is doing my just kind of standard search of users. This, the fallback way of querying your database is just a straight search of whatever that data type is. And in this search, I have a constraint to constrain on the name input. And uh, this checkbox here, very important. This is the first thing that I want to call out. If you have constraints that may or may not uh, need to be applied, right? Let's say that the user leaves this empty. I don't want Bubble to filter on it. I want Bubble to return everybody outside of that. Uh, and so this checkbox will have Bubble ignoring that constraint as if it wasn't there, as long as this input's value is empty. That, that's when that will apply. Why is this helpful? Well, otherwise, Right? If, I, if I didn't have the ability to ignore this, I would have to set up a condition for every possible combination of the search. And just with three inputs, that's a lot of combinations. Imagine a much more complex you know, marketplace type of situation. If you think about searching through Amazon, every time you, you know, put in a query for a product, on one of the sides there, you have dozens of filters that are available, drop downs, radio buttons, checkboxes inputs to type in ranges of things, star ratings, all of that. It's an exponential number of combinations of filters that a user can select. You can't anticipate all of those. And it would really be, I mean, number one, cumbersome to build out all of those possible conditions. But it also increases the risk of error uh, on your part for building all of that out accurately. So by checking this box here, this allows you to add every possible constraint as much as possible here. Um, even if the user isn't going to filter on all of those properties. Because if, if, they're, if they're left blank, then it's just going to ignore it. So definitely take advantage of that as much as you can. Now, you'll also see that I have a filter here after my search. This is only necessary if you have more advanced filtering that you need to do. As much as possible, put your constraints in this first search window because those constraints are applied at the server end. So before Bubble can send all of the results, it's going to filter and then send the results from there. Uh, so that could be a much you know, smaller amount of data that gets sent to the browser could potentially lead to a faster loading for the user. Um, if you have a filter with your constraints, Bubble has to first return all of the search uh, results uh, before that and then filter on the browser side. That can make a difference in the uh, loading speed for the user, depending on the complexity of all of the search constraints and filters involved, not to mention the number of possible results that can come back. Now, I do have a filter here because I wanted to take advantage of the advanced capability to work with my hobbies filter. I'm comparing two lists with one another, users list of hobbies with the selected list of hobbies, and I need an advanced filter to accomplish this particular thing. Now, with all of this said, this is not the only approach to create the behavior that I just demonstrated. There are many ways to approach this. The important thing is, if you're struggling with creating the right combination of constraints, take a look at 
your data structure. Number one, you may have an inefficient structure. You may be missing some relationship fields or uh, may need to add a field just to create a shortcut and make things more efficient for you. So pay attention to that structure. You want it to work for you as much as possible. Now, here's an example of where you may need to have a condition to create a separate search scenario. Um, you know, as much as possible, you want to reduce the number of searches, but depending on what you're doing, like I said, you may still need to have separate scenarios, conditions, maybe even workflows that um, update your data source. In this case, this is to handle my onboarding status filter. Uh, my default data source handles the view all scenario, but this data source will incorporate that drop down if they only want to see people who have onboarded or only see people who have not been onboarded specifically. So this is one where I would want to start to be careful with if I have more inputs involved, because again, the last thing I want to do is create a drop down for every single possible uh, combination of filters. But this is an example of when I might want to split things out. Now, there are two possible searches that I might be asking Bubble to perform here. How can I reduce this? How can I still keep it to one search only? Well, a really good approach you can take is to take advantage of custom states. Custom states let you temporarily remember a single value or a list of values. So one thing I could do here is as soon as my page is loaded or whenever I want to begin my search, I can set up a custom state to remember the list of users in an unfiltered state as much as possible. And then everything else I want to do from there as I apply these filters or I reset them, I just manipulate the custom state, right? The search has already been done. I already have my baseline list of users. Everything I do going forward from there, I just manipulate that list, whether it's through conditions or through maybe a workflow, a series of steps to uh, change the change the custom state list and inject it into the table or put it into a repeating group, depending on what elements you're working with. But that is something that you also want to be very mindful of. How can you refer to the results of searches that have already happened, that may already have at a baseline the, the data that you need? And if it needs further manipulation from there, you can use your expressions to filter on top of that. Um, or maybe combine it with other custom state values if necessary. Other things to keep in mind also include um, how much data you are showing to the user at once, right? If I've got a table here and I have potentially 50,000 items in my database, I don't want my table to be loading 50,000 things at one time, right? Implement a paging system where maybe you show 25 things at a time and have the user navigate to the next 25. Only in that navigation action will you, you know, update the data source, update your custom state. It's all very strategic, but start with your baseline. Make sure that you're at least getting the accurate results first from your filter expressions, right? You're actually seeing the data that you want to see and then see if you can spot any opportunities to reduce those searches, um, move those filters into the server side end of the searching constraints uh, and see how things change for your user's experience and your cost from there. All right, I hope this was helpful. And if it was, definitely check out the content you see on the screen now. These videos will help you better build and launch your app and a lot more quickly too.